What do you see when you look at these pictures? I see young people that have lost hope. I see young people that are distressed and desperate. And I see young people that are worried about their future. The recent financial crisis has led to a disproportionate increase in youth unemployment around the world. In Europe, over the past four years, the youth unemployment rate has increased by almost 60%, leaving roughly every fourth young person that is generally employable without a job. But this is not just a European problem. This is a truly global problem. What you can see on this chart, on the y-axis, you see the youth unemployment rate. On the x-axis, you can see the adult unemployment rate. I try to depict a range of countries from OECD that are mapping the youth unemployment versus adult unemployment. And from this chart, you can see two major problems. One is that there are countries with extraordinarily high rates of youth unemployment. They're reaching almost 60% youth unemployment rate. But there's a second problem out there, which most people are not so aware of. These countries here, and many others, they have roughly four times as many unemployed youth as they have unemployed adults. Try to imagine that situation with a global average of being almost three, so the ratio of youth unemployment to adult unemployment. So you can really see that there are two somewhat separate issues, but they're connected. We all know that unemployment has severe effects on an individual, but also on society. And if such a situation persists, you can only imagine what kind of effects this has on the long run. Unemployment has particularly high negative effects on young people. So during the first years of a professional life, if you're unemployed, that leaves extremely deep scars in a person. So what does this mean? Should we just forget about today's youth, move on, brand them as a lost generation? As an entrepreneur and as a researcher, I came across different strategies that we can look at in order to put in place solutions in the short term, but also in the long term, to address today's youth, but also to tomorrow's youth, to avoid the continuation of this problem. This is Raoul. When Raoul was 27 years old, living here in Switzerland, he became unemployed. Despite having a great IT education and having been in the workplace for about one and a half years. After a few months being unemployed, he learned about a government program that helps unemployed individuals transition into self-employment. This is provided by the employment agencies, helping them, if they have a business idea, get continued monetary support, get professional coaching support, to lift themselves out of unemployment and become job creators, so become self-employed. Most people are not aware of these programs, and most people, in fact, also would never assume that unemployed individuals would have what it takes to become an entrepreneur. We did, over the past three and a half years at EPFL, at the Chair for Entrepreneurship, a pan-European research project to investigate these programs. And we found remarkable results. These individuals are extremely motivated, entrepreneurially speaking. These people not only create jobs for themselves, but they create jobs for others. Their companies have above average survival rates. After three years, more than 75% of their companies are still alive. And they're extremely happy with their life. So what our research suggests is that if we put more of these programs in place, particularly tailored to the characteristics and the needs of the young people, that we can leave out of this youth unemployment crisis that we're facing at the moment, Immediately. We know these programs work, we just need to get them more visible and more spread out over more countries, because not even every country has them in place yet so far. But this is short term. If we look at tomorrow's youth, the next generation, how can we avoid that tomorrow's youth 
will not run into the same problem as today's youth. Because tomorrow's youth has distinctively different characteristics from previous generations. Tomorrow's youth is born immersed into a fully virtual environment, changing the way we live, work, and think. Already today, we can experience a strong mismatch between the skills that young people bring with them when they enter the labor market and the requirements from the labor market. There are different strategies we can utilize to address this mismatch. The most obvious strategy is to try to directly tackle this mismatch by either increasing the amount of available vacancies that match the skills of young people or by trying to change the skills of the young people to educate them so they're better prepared for what the labor market demands. But there's also another strategy. This other strategy accepts that there is a mismatch. It accepts that the next generation maybe has skills that maybe do not fit into today's labor market anymore, at least some of them. This strategy focuses on making them job creators rather than job seekers. We all know by now that entrepreneurship is an important driver of job creation, economic development, and social well-being, if not the single most important element of these three. Over the past years, we've experienced a rapid increase of entrepreneurship support programs all around the world. But what we see is that they were created in a rather uncoordinated manner without really knowing what works and what doesn't work. They were just put in place but never really assessed. New entrepreneurs, when they start their company, they never start on their own. They're always immersed in an environment. They're supported by experienced entrepreneurs as mentors or as role models. They go through entrepreneurial trainings and programs. They raise money from some people. These different elements together create entrepreneurial ecosystems. So we became inherently interested in understanding how do entrepreneurial ecosystems actually work. When I mention the word ecosystem, most of you probably think of something like this, a coral reef or a pond with frogs in it. This is the typical understanding of an ecosystem coming from the biological part. But in fact, entrepreneurial ecosystems are very similar to biological ecosystems. They're also composed of living and non-living organisms exposed to externalities. In the biological ecosystem, it's the sun and the weather. In the entrepreneurial ecosystem, it's the regulatory system, the political environment, the availability of infrastructure. So in fact, it's very much the same. I'm sure that every one of you knows dozens of examples of entrepreneurial ecosystems. Just to mention one, Silicon Valley. Why is it that everybody knows Silicon Valley? Is it just good marketing, or is there more to it? How did they evolve? How did Silicon Valley evolve over time? Why there and not somewhere else? What can we learn from them if we want to come up with new entrepreneurial ecosystems? These questions inspired us to move on and understand the main ingredients of entrepreneurial ecosystems so, and the main ingredients of functional entrepreneurial ecosystems though, so we can come up with new strategies to build new ecosystems but also to assess existing ecosystems to understand where the strengths and weaknesses are so we can specifically pinpoint where the problems are to put in place programs that supplement what is missing. To understand what an entrepreneurial ecosystem is, we created this framework. Try to imagine an orchestra, a symphony orchestra, trying to play a piece of music. Just having violins most likely will not work. You need the right composition of instruments. They together create the emotion that music can have. Just having one or 20 of one particular instrument will not do the work. It's just the same with entrepreneurship. You cannot create individual promotion programs. You need to have a 
healthy balance of these different programs. And like with music, it's not about maximizing the amount of all these different elements, it's about the composition. And for some music piece, you need more violinists. For another one, you might need more percussionists. It's the same with entrepreneurial ecosystems. Each ecosystem is different, and depending on the strength and uniqueness, if it's high-tech or if it's tourism, whatever it is, you need a different composition of support. So based on this map, we see on three dimensions main components of such an entrepreneurial ecosystem. On the very outer circle, you see these externalities that I mentioned before, like the sun and the water for the biological ecosystem. On the inner circle, you can see entrepreneurship-specific components, such as the availability of skill trainings and education programs for novice entrepreneurs, availability of financing, venture capitalists, business angels, banks that are willing to give loans, but also the entrepreneurial culture. Is the culture in the people, inside their minds, is it, do they have the mindset? Do they have the entrepreneurial attitude, perception towards risk? To understand these, we started assessing effectively every single entrepreneurial ecosystem in the world. We're mapping every entrepreneurship support program in the world to understand uniquenesses of these programs, strengths and weaknesses. So we can come up with strategies to address these. Each of these factors that you saw on this map, on this framework, we created an index to rate them. And then we have an overall ecosystem index. This is an example how we think the entrepreneurial ecosystem is in Switzerland. Of course, it's difficult to generalize. There are some regions, some cities that are more entrepreneurial than others, so it's always difficult to generalize. But roughly, and I'm sure everybody in here who is somewhat familiar with the entrepreneurship structure here can understand some of these points. Switzerland is very strong in support of entrepreneurs. The innovation, the infrastructure is great. Support is available. There is so much out there that helps young entrepreneurs or also old entrepreneurs become successful entrepreneurs. But there are very few entrepreneurs. It feels like in a five-star hotel. There's a lot of support, but very few guests. <laughs> what you can really see here, and I think everybody can understand that very well, the element of culture, the mindset, being afraid of failing, that's something in the mindset. It's not necessarily bad, it's just there. We're not saying that we, we have the solution to get Switzerland down here. I don't think that should be our goal. But we need to be aware of that to then come up with programs to address this specifically. And if we now look at tomorrow's youth, if we want to make them become job creators, these are some of the problems we need to put in place and solutions. We need to look at them and we can help them become job creators in different elements. We can help them become job creators in a very playful way, early on during the education system. At home, you can start having fun with your kids and let them learn the basics of entrepreneurship in a really playful and risk-free way. At the same time, you can have serial entrepreneurs and experienced entrepreneurs come into the education system, talk to them, so that the perception of what an entrepreneur is kind of becomes more normal. Because at the moment, everybody thinks entrepreneurship is about Google and Facebook, but it's not. Entrepreneurship is something very normal. Everybody can be an entrepreneur. Maybe not everybody wants to be an entrepreneur. Perfectly fine. But it's not rocket science. And if we want to make tomorrow's youth job creators, we need to make them understand and reflect about what they want to do with their life. And maybe some become entrepreneurs, Others might not. At least they went through this reflection process. Yes, global youth unemployment is a major issue. But I'm optimistic that if we look at short-term solutions for today's youth and long-term solutions for tomorrow's youth by systematically looking at bottom-up strategies to make an entrepreneurial culture, that we can address this issue and we can help them in redefining the labor market for themselves. To close off this talk, I would like to throw out a question, 
more to reflect on. What if four years from back, we had devoted one per mil of the money that went into bailing out banks and put it into youth entrepreneurship? Where do you think the youth unemployment rate would be today? Thank you very much.